Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds today. Um, I know more people will be trickling in um, as they're probably rounding and whatnot on patients. Uh, but it really gives me great, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Uma Kodigal, our speaker and presenter for today. Dr. Uma Kodigal is not only a, uh, a friend, a colleague, and a mentor, but just an outstanding clinician and world-class leader, and we're pleased to have her here today. She is currently the Executive Director for Cincinnati Children's Community Population Health Efforts, and in this role, UMA collaborates across teams looking at population health and improving the health of children in the greater Cincinnati region. She also serves as a broader role as a Senior Fellow at Cincinnati Children's Medical Center, and she consults on behalf and is an ambassador for Cincinnati Children's to other organizations, such as Children's National. Uh, she formerly served as a Senior Vice President for Quality, Safety, and Transformation, and was the Executive Director of the James M. Anderson Center for Health Systems at Cincinnati Children's Medical Center. And for those of you who know Cincinnati Children, it really has singularly been UMA who has built that program and has created what we have nationally across this country around uh, child health outcomes. So a little more about her background. She received her Master's of Science in Clinical Epidemiology and Clinical Effectiveness from the Harvard School of Public Health. She has served as a visiting scholar at the Center for Risk Analysis at Harvard School of Public Health and at Tufts New England Medical Center. Um, she was born in Bombay, India. She received her undergraduate and medical degree from University of Bombay. She's a senior fellow in the Institute of Healthcare Improvement. She serves on the board of directors for the Ohio Children's Hospital Association. She chairs the Quality Improvement Committee at the Children's Hospital Association, where I have the privilege of working with UMA and have for many years. And she serves as a member of the advisory committee, had, had served as a member of the advisory committee at Toronto Patient Safety Center, as, and is an associate editor for BMG Quality and Safety. She is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. So, on a personal note, I just have to say that there are a handful of people who come into your life as a friend, as a mentor, as a confidant, and Uma is one of those people to me personally. I've had the privilege of knowing her for over 20 years, working side by side on committees, and she has just really has done a fantastic job shaping our pediatric quality safety and healthcare systems in this country and internationally. So we are so pleased to have Uma here today. Thank you. It's always bad when you're introduced, it takes so long to talk that you can't get to your presentation, but I, I'm so privileged to be here and thank you for those kind words. And certainly there are people here, I know I turned this on, I to press something, I forgot. So certainly, you know, there are people here that I've known for a long time and uh, colleagues, and it's great to see any of you. Um, this, the other second thing I would say that, well, although I'm presenting a series of slides and some thoughts about transforming systems for healthcare and health, this is really the work of hundreds of people at St. Children's, and while I might not refer to each of them at each given slide, it's just important to know that this is not any by any one person's work. And some of the stuff that I will present are results that really are led by leaders here uh, itself, you know, looking specifically at uh, Cardiology Collaborative or the FBS Safety Collaborative or many of the national um, transformation efforts that we've all engaged in together. And I think it's important to point out that unlike adult care, um, we have been models for this among, in, among children's hospitals in our ability to partner, collaborate, learn together, think about it, while at the same time, you know, there may be opportunities for competition. So I think in this space of quality improvement, there has been a lot achieved, much more than we would have expected. I'm going to sort of walk you through our transformation journey for the last 15 to um, 20 years um, and reflect a little bit on the learnings, and this will be somewhat of a 
breathless talk because the journey has been somewhat breathless um, and fast. Our vision at Cincinnati Children's is to be the leader in improving child health. As we designed our, our systems, we began to really understand what our core beliefs were around, you know, uh, compassion, but also equally valuing science as a large academic organization. Part of the challenge in this journey was understanding how to get academic faculty to be engaged in this work uh, so that this became a sustainable part of the organization. And then as I'm doing here today and in general, believing that sharing and learning together and being transparent are important uh, steps that one takes internally as well. Uh, we began our work very seriously in about 2001, 2002 when the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation wanted to sort of create Toyotas in healthcare. This came after the 1999 report called To Err is Human and then the 2001 report that laid out the framework for what it would take to transform healthcare. And as many of you know, even now, 10, 15 years later, we're not quite where we thought, where the IOM thought we would be as they laid out uh, the framework for how to think about this work. And, and certainly I think the continued reports on safety suggest that we have still a very long way to go in terms of delivery. So, you know, radical ways, changing how we think, changing how the organization works. So right from the beginning, you know, we were charged by by the RWJ to really come up with transformational models. We worked with, uh, you know, a couple of organizations in Sweden, in Denmark, and in the UK, as well as five or six organizations across the country. We were the only children's hospital there, but we were, but we were selected across a very large group of people. The first thing we did was to say, where should we start? And I, I would tell you that in writing the application for the RWG, there were very few division directors that wanted to work with us. So Maria Brito, who my colleague in, in crime and I would try to find a, a division director who would agree to consider setting up on this transformation journey. Bob Wilmot was the division director in pulmonary medicine. He's now at St. Louis. He was kind of the only guy that said yes. We had been working with him a little bit to look at uh, experience in patients. So the first thing we had to do was to figure out where we fit, where were we in cystic fibrosis. And we called the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and asked them for the data. They usually sent us a binder every year. It was a paper binder. You know, we looked through all the charts. You couldn't remember from page 43 to page 85 what, what the story was. Uh, but when we asked them to pre release the data and tell us who was best, they, they said they wouldn't be able to do that. But the terms of agreement of collecting the data was confidentiality, and therefore they would not release that information. It took us about a year to get the CF Foundation to transparently release the data. And uh, it really took CF parents to have that conversation and, and Don Berwick and Paul Bedalden were part of that uh, conversation. And when they released the data, this is what we found. We found that we were kind of somewhere in the middle of the, of the place, not quite where we had expected ourselves to be, since like most academic organizations, we think of ourselves as being considerably more fabulous than we really are. And so when we really looked at the data here, we were kind of middling, bottom third, not particularly impressive. Um, and it took us another um, another six to eight months before we met with the best centers in the country that had the best outcomes and recognized that what we had been practicing was not particularly reliable with individual provider base and, um, you know, in general felt that, well, we, we, we did the best we could, but clearly not there. Interestingly, this is uh, Jerry O'Connor's uh, slide and that he presented several years later. The CF Foundation, after releasing it, and now, of course, if you go to the CF website, you can find all of the centers. The data is very transparent. You know where you are in relation to the rest of the country. But this is where the country was in 1999. So the top right-hand box, which is the best nutritional and the best, um, you know, uh, lung function outcomes, really very small percent, 30 percent of people in the country with that. Um, and then this was um, a video that... We have seven kids. Three of our kids have cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis. CF is a progressive fatal disease that affects a child's lungs and pancreas and requires extensive home treatments. There is currently no cure. One of my sons takes a treatment once a day. 
He's breathing into medication that goes into the lungs, loosens up the mucus. After that breathing treatment, he has CPT, which is physical therapy for the chest. We're kind of knocking on the walls of his lungs, loosening up the mucus so he can cough. I'll just do a little today because your tummy is kind of hurting. My daughter Tess is three, and because of CF, she doesn't gain weight very well. Can you stand up so I can see it better? So the last resort, the doctor suggested putting in a G-tube. So at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, after she eats, we give her about 90 cc's of this high-calorie formula. Okay. We've got to get some weight on her. Okay. We don't want to pressure her too much, but there is that in the back of my mind. She's got to eat, she's got to eat, she's got to eat. The disease itself is a nasty, nasty, nasty disease. People come up and say, hey, Jim, how are the kids doing? And I usually say every breath they take is killing them. Many children with CF must be hospitalized every few months for more intensive treatments. Parents depend on the health care system to provide the same quality of care their children receive at home. Is she off a little bit? Is she off her schedule a little bit? Yeah, because pharmacy didn't get a brain go up here. Yeah. Oh, that was so typical. This morning, when I came in, I asked to make sure that she got the right medication, and she didn't. Okay. Has she been running high sugars later in the day? Because I haven't seen that she has. No, no, no. No. Just at breakfast? Breakfast and dinner. Okay. I want to look at the chart to make sure it's right so it doesn't happen again. Thanks. Uh, it's just the way the system works, the way the pharmacy works. Which is fine, because we need to make sure that her sugars are okay before we give her more insulin. Right. Right. So I think it's a good system. So what we've been doing is... It, 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 it works. Yeah. Okay. She did not get her clear. Right. Okay. She gets like I'm not blaming the doctor. I'm not blaming the nurse. It's just the way the system's set up. One of the first things that we had to do in understanding how bad we were was to be transparent. And we had parents engaged with us in that conversation and still to this day engaged with helping us redesign the system. After we uh, worked on this, going back now to 2008, we found that we were able to, through paying attention to the best behaviors, through reliably applying the best processes, move up in terms of where we were, in terms of outcomes. Each of these, again, is a single site uh, for CF. But more interestingly, by 2006, 2008, now in 2010, the percent of centers across the country, each of these dots represent a single center, had moved up. So now from 28%, 61% of the centers were in that top right-hand box. No new drugs, no new disease, no new, no new treatments, no new therapies, just simply applying what we knew reliably. The CF Foundation is now launching a learning network with the Anderson Center and with centers across the country, which will start fairly soon to begin to see where we could go next in terms of thinking about this work. So this gave us sort of um, both a chance to understand what the issues were and a chance to understand how hard it was going to be to change outcomes and transform systems of care. And so we were not uh, naive about it, but nonetheless also um, quite uh, charged up as we worked with parents and families to think about that. And this is their data now looking at changes in survival for cystic fibrosis, again, without new discoveries. Now, of course, there are several new discoveries that have come around in the last five years. So having reliable systems where they could be applied is really important. And when you think about transforming systems, think about alignment of, of uh, really purpose uh, and intent, alignment of uh, strategy and accountability and then building capacity to change the system. So if we're all kind of aligned and we get together and we say, yep, we want to go north, we still have to know how to go north. And so that's how we spend our time thinking about this. And eventually we want to see this integrated into every part of the organization. And I know that the work that you're doing here is very much along this line of understanding and in, within specialties and within divisions and within units, aligning and understanding that we're all going a certain way. One of the first things that we did, and I, it always surprises me to this day that, when, when, that until we did this work, most organizations didn't tell you what they were accountable for. So I don't think I ever saw a health system that said, oh, yeah, these are our goals. 
um, or this is how we know we're doing well. Now, you know, there were monetary uh, numbers, of course, and there were research dollars numbers and grant dollar numbers and publications, but in our primary business, which was to actually deliver care, it was not clear that we ever had an idea. So one of the first things we did was to gather about 100 people, uh, several parents, uh, several patients, uh, young adults, and sort of asked them to tell us what was wrong with the system. And out of that developed a set of metrics, what we call our big dots, pink circles. Um, you know, first kind of on access flow and productivity, people not stuck in our system because they said they were stuck in waiting rooms, stuck in the hospital, stuck for discharge. In general, a system that didn't move nimbly. Secondly, really around safety and the harm both to employees and patients, which I know that uh, you've spent a lot of time thinking about. Third is really they, while people come not to be stuck and not come to be, and come not to be harmed, they really come to be healed. So what are the outcomes that we're delivering? How well are we actually adhering to the evidence-based practices of what the science tells us we need to do? Staff satisfaction, team well-being, obviously a critical part of an organization's ability to deliver care either safely or uh, in a way with patient experience. These, these measures have remained our measures. Um, and, and many more subsets of measures tucked under them, but this is what sort of guides our work. And then, and then as we do that, then we think about how we organize. And I spent yesterday with your inpatient teams really thinking about how you were working together, and we very quickly realized that if we wanted to move a big dot, a safety dot or a flow dot, we really had to align ourselves much better than we were. Most units were working randomly. They were working well, but not necessarily aligned to the patient journey. So we began to think about that, and this, this, um, uh, this sort of CSI, a new clinical structure, a temporary structure that we, that we designed and developed with system-wide goals and then cascaded down to individual microsystems. By microsystem, I mean a group of people taking care of a population of patients. It could be a clinic. It could be an inpatient unit. And then uh, where possible, the individual performance. So we designed this new system in order to be able to build our integration uh, of creating these, these site of care teams that I think you're doing right now, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, so that each, these are our meso systems. Under these are lots of microsystems, so maybe 25 to 30 inpatient units you know, a bulk of outpatient clinics and so on that I know Denise and others are kind of accountable for, a peri -up team that sees an enormous amount of, of caseload and how is it safe and how does it work and, and how effectively can it work, ED, home health, and then a mental health team, which we added on because of really a very significant challenge in this space and how do we integrate that care together. They report into... A, a clinical system improvement integrating team, which is composed of faculty, nursing allied services, and administrative and community leadership, responsible for acting on these on these system level measures I showed you, and then a board leadership team and a board committee to which we reported. I think until we created the patient care committee as a board in 2002, there wasn't necessarily a board committee where quality was specifically reported to, where we could talk about safety. Uh, in a very specific way, and that board committee became much more significant component of the board's work. The board shifted its thinking, if you will, from not just thinking about financial, and we always had a research committee of the board, but really creating a patient care committee of the board where we could think about much of these activities and much of this work. And then, uh, obviously, the use of data so that microsystems and individual divisions have their data aligned to those system-level goals. So we're kind of understanding the contribution of individual divisions and individual units to a system level measure and that we are together trying to move these big dots. In addition, we had to sort of learn new science. We had spent a lot of, a lot of our learning, like many people, really thinking more about, um, okay, I think I need to go backwards. Um, can you make me go backwards? I'm sorry, I messed up. There you go. So I think in addition, we had knowledge about how to take care of patients. So we had clinical knowledge, we had knowledge from research, we had knowledge from randomized trials, but how to change systems was knowledge we didn't have. And we began to learn about these different sciences, a model for improvement, Deming system of profound knowledge and how that was used to transform the automotive industry and then really thinking about specifically execution frameworks, developing leaders for day-to-day -day change. And that then led us to really think about 
testing and learning our way into a new model. Usually we were used to programmatic approaches that said do X or do Y and then hope X and Y happened. But really, how did we know to move from system A to system B? And, and this science then is something that we've spent now a lot of time thinking and learning about and, and focused on. In addition, we had to build capability because we had spent all our time building capability and capacity for clinical knowledge, how to do X, how to do Y, but not systems thinking, not uh, resilience, not reliability science, not many of those things that are not taught in medical school or certainly not taught in residencies and those are changing. And in addition, we had to think about a new field of research in the system space that, that needed to happen in order for us to understand, you know, and bring uh, scientific knowledge to bear here. So we built this model for frontline uh, modules for employees uh, associated then with our core course, which is our uh, intermediate improvement science series, which we now teach both internally and externally, but in addition, an advanced improvement methods training specifically for researchers so they could think about more complex methods to think and study systems, and a quality scholars program modeled on the VA quality scholars program, so researchers and faculty, you know, whether they were nursing faculty or, or MD or PhD could really pursue as their career track so that we have two tracks really for faculty, the operational track and the research track, enabling us to then bring those things together uh, uh, to think about this space. I'm going to give you some examples of thinking about it. The first one that you all spend a lot of time on and almost all the children's hospitals now spend a considerable amount of their time on is really thinking about safety. We began to think about safety probably in about 2003, 2004 when we first noticed that IHI was putting together their initial work on ventilator associated pneumonia and the idea that some of these things were preventable began to be raised as a possibility. So thinking at the, starting at the peak of the pyramid here and really looking at serious harm, lost time injuries for employees where the harm is very significant, moving down to think about, you know, all of the infections and the OSHA recordables to events of minimal harm. And in, in the first place we began with process redesign reliable key processes, application of the evidence, moving more to think about culture, and then finally where we are now is really thinking about human factors and its integration into the work. How do we design it in a way that people don't use it the wrong way versus persuade everybody to kind of work, you know, the right way in terms of the system. So as we think about that, obviously you're doing a lot of this work, standardization, a very important part of it, an enormous barrier to overcome since most providers really believe that they bring some extraordinary uh, discerning thinking to this place that allows them to work individually and in different ways. And of course, the first mechanism is really figuring out standardization. And there are huge barriers to that in terms of culture change, especially where, where we see individuals believing that their individual performance is pretty extraordinary and therefore should, you know, should remain their, their kind of beef them, if you will. And so those culture changes were fairly difficult, whether you were thinking about nursing culture or whether you were thinking about physician culture. So beginning to think about bundles in about 2004, 2005, then beginning to think about high reliability. And at that point in time, we began to understand what we didn't know even more. And beginning to understand that we were really uh, more, uh, we really need to look at other industries. Wyke and Sutcliffe from the University of Michigan had done some fantastic work and had really described the journey of high reliability along with uh, Brené Almaberti from, uh, from France, thinking about this in other high, uh, high um, reliability organizations, environment rich with potential for errors, you know, complex processes, complex technology, unforgiving political and social environment, and certainly any of you that have been involved in a serious safety event have a feel for what that feels like and how hard it is to forget, not only for you, but for the patients and family. And then how do you experiment? How do you learn under these kinds of circumstances? So Kathleen Sutcliffe became a very uh, important person for us in this work. She's really partnered with us to help us think through this very carefully. And then understanding these characteristics in, in high reliability organizations where little things, people pay attention to little things, where the expertise is on the front line, not in the, not in the senior suite where there's a commitment to resilience, where transparency is important, where speaking up is encouraged, not discouraged. So if you bring bad news, somebody welcomes you and says, hey, I'm glad that you spoke up, tell me more about it. And then preventing errors and detecting latent weaknesses in the system so that the Swiss cheese model of the error doesn't line up to harm the patient. So all of this work coming out of nuclear 
uh, industry out of aircraft carriers, and we spent some time with some of these people understanding how they work, what was the science behind it, and how do we think about applying it. So, you know, flattening the hierarchy was important, the use of huddles, situational awareness, knowing what was happening, being able to predict what was going to happen and mitigating it instead of sort of being surprised every day that something happened, knowing the circumstances, building models, and I think, you know, uh, we partnered with you in some of this work and thinking about it. So our first recognition of this was, I think, uh, maybe when the Australian uh, folks began to say that codes were preventable, and the, that was probably in the early 2005s, and we began to ask the question, could we avoid codes? And generally thinking about uh, moving upstream to think about medical emergency teams, starting to think about uh, really the pediatric early warning score, which I saw on your boards yesterday, and, and then really systematic identification and mitigation. So could we predict on admission who was likely to do that, or in four-hour increments could we begin to say who might, who might do that? And, and then the situational awareness models that come out of, out of the military that we began to apply. So really here thinking about testing, really thinking about, uh, you know, predicting, and now I think working with you, uh, specifically with Rahul and others thinking specifically about data that allows us to predict who's going to deteriorate in the system, and we have some early models that are that are emerging from our work that we're testing at this point in time. Developing a high reliability culture was a whole different problem. It was really about, you know, microsystem leadership and people working together and developing mindfulness, harm owned by the front line. As we do that, then we begin to also understand uh, what causes deterioration, and this is an example of, um, of what we call a stress microsystem. So while we may know that bundle needs to be done, while we might know it needs to happen, while we have a pretty good idea of what needs to happen, we're not as confident that it happens all the time because the folks in the microsystem are, are not working every day in the same way. They come in today, the system looks different, they've got, you know, two really sick patients, they've got somebody coming back from the operating room, can they pay attention to that bundle compliance? And so we've begun to really on a shift-by-shift -shift basis, begin to look at the, encourage the nurses to comment on the nature of this microsystem, what does it feel like, and therefore what mitigation is necessary, and then really thinking about what mitigation strategies could be used for qualitative data, not just for quantitative data, so not just hours per patient day or staffing models, but literally how am I feeling on the shift, and therefore I'm not able to do my work, and having the managers pay attention to that in order to be able to mitigate it. So really moving to a more more and more proactive system to try to prevent harm. And, and then running it through a series of huddles, in our case starting at 6.30 in the morning, the daily operations be brief, that enable us to bring people together. The huddles are probably the single most important way to change culture or the fastest way to change culture because you have cycle times that are daily, you can have six cycle times and you could figure out how to test and learn your way to be able to do that. And through this then, we are able to mitigate and avoid failures in a variety of different systems. We had about an 80 to 90 percent reduction in our serious safety events since we started this work, and similar rates of fall in, in terms of our serious harm, and, and I know that many of you are seriously engaged. And now we're kind of in this human factors integration, just trying to understand how not to do things the wrong way and not design things so that people make mistakes. This will take us probably another five to ten years to figure out how to apply it, but it is sort of the next place where we are working. I wanted to um, uh, use uh, really another example, um, you know, of, of flow. In this case, really thinking about flow, and this is our second big dot, which is patients delayed in our system, and certainly I think Brian and others that have come from Society Children's have experienced our thinking in this space. Of course, it's a real challenge, uh, you know, patients, and our purpose here is really to have the patient in the right bed with the right nursing staff, with the right expertise, with the right support so that we don't have patients who are in beds with that expertise maybe, maybe not quite as optimal as it happens, and, and then to control variability and ultimately to manage our operations kind of in that way. Now, interestingly, the place that flow works is really the operating room. So we spend all our time trying to work on the discharge efficiency side, but we found that the artificial variation was really important. And so the first step was really in the operating room. So on the left, you see an old pattern of how operating rooms were managed, where you might schedule the patients, but then you add in these patients all the time. Your, your cases are backed up, and I, maybe you've done all of this already, but in our case, we were working late in the evenings with cases that came on. Um, sometimes having trouble getting all of our urgent cases in, 
and and by by really running much more uh, better complex models and analytics, we're able to really say what is our predictive need, what is our actual need, and how do we manage it. So on the right, you'll see that we systematically then say scheduled cases add on and work in, and we run our models so we know what these look like and what happens. When you do that, then you have to classify the patients to get agreement among the surgeons about the different categories. This is a 30-minute case, it's a four-hour case, and that, as you can imagine, is not easy to do. But what the surgeon gets in return, what the operating room and anesthesiologist gets in return, is an operating room that runs according to predictions that, and, and patients know when their cases are going to be started, when they're finished, and what happens. And once you do that, you can begin to see the variation reduced, but then you can also see the ICU outflow smoothing happening as the next case. So at this point, we're predicting what cases from the operating room should go to the ICU. We're capping that so that we are reducing artificial variability uh, depending on surgeon um, golfing schedule, or particularly if two surgeons golf together, then, you know, those schedules get pretty wonky. So we have had to, have to think about those and have those conversations. And again, this has now been in place for quite a while then beginning to do discharge predictions so we could predict when a patient's going to go home and then discharging them within two hours of meeting their discharge criteria so that we could really manage the system in a different kind of way. And we do that, we can see significant delays in our system and we can respond to those patients that tell us that they're stuck in our system. And, and we then measure our, our flow failures, which are holes in the ED or patients staying overnight or any of those flow failures and answer the question, are we managing our system to be able to change flow well? I think when we think about those two, we're really thinking about, uh, about really the system, the chassis, getting it right for the chassis, not necessarily thinking about the individual patient. And so obviously improving clinical outcomes is what we're all about at the end of the day, and whether it's acutely improving them or improving them chronically. A vast majority of children in our organizations, yours and, and mine, really come there with very complex needs and complex chronic disease. And uh, using our CF example, we really begun to think about this. This is, of course, the McCall Institute's work at, at Wagner's work on the model for how you improve outcomes of children with chronic illness, not only focusing on, on, on efficiency and so on, but really self-management and an empowered patient that understands how to manage their illness. And, and then building registries for population management, patient reported outcomes as a way of understanding how does this patient function, can they do their activities that they need to do versus they're in remission but they're having a miserable quality of life, so they need to understand that. And, and then being moving again like we did in the inpatient system from a reactive to a proactive system, so very good previous planning, very good understanding of, of the registries and, and, uh, and care management. And then finally, you know, self-management as the primary mechanism by which people improve chronic outcomes. That is, it's the therapies provided in the system are good, but it's at the end of the day how they do their exercises every day or their chest physiotherapy, as you saw. Tracy Blackwell to do it, or all of the things that they have to do to manage their illness. Now, when we build that, then we build a foundation for research, because at the point that we standardize care, deliver standardized care, deliver therapeutic care, we can understand the gap, and then we can begin to answer the question, what are the genetic markers that, that we need to look for when we're thinking about why children with IBD don't have remissions? And so we can begin to clean the noise in the system. And this idea of a learning system, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about so process reliability is key outcomes. Then move when you get all of these processes, all components moving together. As I talked to Ed Wagner about his work, really, you know, he emphasizes the whole system that has to come together to work, not individual components of the system. This is IBD remission rates and, and then really beginning to go back to the laboratory to answer the question, who are those 20% of the children that don't respond? Why don't they respond? and what can I learn you know, from that point of view. So we have a, a large number of teams beginning to look at disease states, and we have a large number of teams now using the McCall model to really improve outcomes in, in chronic disease. And this is then the sweet spot for most clinical divisions because this is where their research work is, this is where they specialize in terms of thinking about their work, and so um, you know, a lot of, lot of uh, teams working on this space with, I think, modest improvement as we do the work. The movement of outcomes in chronic disease takes much longer. 
and in the acute care space because of the importance of self-management and, and really engaging the whole family in this work. And, and uh, we are just in the process of, um, of adding more, more teams to our wave one and wave two teams to begin to think about that. I think an important area that we focused on when we think about this work is inside the hospital, but then really thinking about scale. One of the biggest challenges and improvement, whether you're thinking about the community or whether you're thinking about children on, on whole, is there are lots of small, small, small experiments being run, but there's not sufficient scale. So everybody can point to a clinic or a small population, but how do we actually solve the problem for the country? The learning health system that the Institute of Medicine came together that was a model that we used for this work really from a transformational grant from the NIH, really trying to understand how we could transform outcomes for children with chronic illness. So the patients and providers come together to do the work. The discovery is a natural outgrowth of the care of the patient. Um, and then that all of this happens kind of in real time. So a focus on outcome, building community, effective use of technology and learning systems. This is work led by Peter Margolis and Michael Stead from the from Cincinnati, along with colleagues, and I know there are several in this room that are working in these models of learning networks and, and really thinking about these learning systems. And we spend a, a lot of time uh, with folks from the MIT Media Lab trying to understand how collective work happens together, what does co-production look like. Uh, this is the work of, um, of Elna Oldstrom from, um, from Sweden that really builds this understanding of what causes people to cooperate together. And so we've really gone to many other sciences to understand how this uh, comes together. So the model then is patients and families and clinicians coming together in a point of care learning system, learning engine, standardizing the care processes, registry building, you know, uh, measuring standard outcomes, and, and then building comparative effectiveness research. And I'll give you an example. And here we begin to think about human-centered design. So the work that Procter & Gamble does as they design their products, how do we bring that design to work in our environment? And what kinds of personas are there and what kinds of people are there that we're designing these systems for? And, and uh, really this is very deep work on understanding how people behave and, and how they work. Um, and, uh, you know, then we frame the issue, build the empathy for the people, identify the prototypes that we have to build, and then think about what to scale. So this now moves us into, into a different kind of science, if you will, again, in, in thinking about it, much more social science, more, more psychology, uh, you know, and more ways of thinking about it. And in this space, then, we're really thinking about if we open the possibility that people could work together, I think I just flashed it twice is what I was told, we can begin to think about ways in which we could produce not individually but produce together through the generosity of people working together. So the Wikipedia model is a model in this regard. And so the learning networks are now built on bringing the science from the biology to, to then the science really about how people work in systems and think about systems. So this is then uh, the improved care now model. Uh, data is collected at the encounter. The data is now abstracted. Now Cerner and Epic are working together in this space. Uh, the data entry is streamlined. Um, the data is available as a visit. The pre-visit planning is done in an effective way, so you know among the patients coming in that day what's happening to those patients. Um, you know, the, the, the data collection is relatively standardized. The population management reports are presented to you as a group, so you have an idea of how you're managing your populations, and I think you do this here for the inflammatory bowel disease work. And then you're building a community, really, so that people are participating together. So patients are producing their health with you versus you're doing something, you know, to them. And I'll skip through some of these slides. Uh, but, you know, this is uh, Wallace Crandall's, uh, Margolis and Coletti's presentation that they just did, uh, really looking at where the remission rates are now, our numbers are now at about the 80, 85 percent, and we can begin to answer the question for the kids that are not doing well across the country and, and uh, beginning to understand that. Similar uh, sorts of models applied for other networks. I'm going to skip this video in the interest of time. But these networks allow you to do factorial design. So I could answer the question, which of these things makes a difference? You know, previous planning, population management, or self-management support. Site A chooses to do all three. I can now answer the question, which is more important? And how do I kind of think about it? So big numbers, large centers, a uh, lot of work together to do, 
now I could move outcomes faster than I and an individual site doing that. And I think NPC QIC, which is stop and reductions in cardiac mortality and hypoplastic left heart and weight gain, I think unprecedented work that would not be possible for a single site to really think about. But more importantly, the work is done as part, as the research is done as part of the work um, and therefore really kind of important to do. Um, the ability to really think about this engages everybody and I think is an important piece of work. I, uh, I'll show you some more examples of uh, RAIDS. This is the Ohio Children's Hospital Serious Safety Events work, now called SBS, uh, work that you're all participating in, but we're learning faster. We're learning, I think we have our weekly reports that tell us what harm is happening at what individual hospital that very quickly gets taken back into operations and we're able to look and say, is that happening at my place? And can I stop, you know, doing that? But the innovation is happening everywhere. It's not happening at one site. People are solving a big problem that nobody can solve, but the generosity allows people to share and therefore to learn faster. Um, the currently we have, we have about 400 plus teams in these uh, work and a lot of CTSAs, and this is the financial savings of SPS, uh, which all of you participate in you know, through this work that's really kind of important. Again, co-production with patients and families, but co-production across the country now really to improve outcomes for kids. Uh, this is a, a statewide collaborative on reducing late preterm births with very significant impact led by Carol Lanning and Jay Imes from Ohio State, who's the obstetrician involved in this. And, and I think we're now going to begin to work on prematurity across the state using this model, the Ohio Perineal Quality Collaborative uh, Network. Um, I think uh, I want to just end finally with thinking about health care and health. So I think as, although we've done a lot of this work, it's pretty clear to us that, that we're not improving the health of children. We're improving the health of the health care. We're making a difference. We're reducing harm. I mean, this is uh, kind of Cincinnati looks very idyllic and beautiful, um, but this is what it looks like. This is a neighborhood right around the hospital, and here's our fancy new tower. So 46% uh, of children in the city of Cincinnati live in poverty. We have the second highest rate of top children living in poverty in the country. Uh, very significant episodes of um, what we would call harm, except this is in the community. It's not inside the hospital, and we're beginning to kind of think about it. Our largest increase in beds inpatient bed days is mental health. Um, this comes from years and years of, of uh, challenges and neglect. We know how to prevent it. There are some very good uh, recommendations from the Institute of Medicine, and, and there's a forum that I work on that has a pretty, good idea, a pretty good idea of how to work upstream to do that. But we've not really thought about that at all. We've begun to look at hotspots to understand what, what is happening in these hotspots. This is mapping asthma admissions by neighborhood. Uh, this is, there are very huge differences in neighborhoods. I'm sure you see the same thing here based upon where you live. And for children that come from different neighborhoods, their rates of, of uh, admissions are high, but they also have all of these problems, transportation, poverty, uh, depressed parents, you know, housing that's not safe. And so we've begun to map these to building code violations using legal aid to be able to help us fix some of these things. Again, using design thinking, thinking about how we would make life different for Daryl. So Daryl has asthma, and we know about the medications he takes, but what's more important in Daryl's life is where he lives, what happens to him every weekend, how many homes he moves to, what's the stability of his family. So if we design care for Daryl simply by giving him his prescription when he goes home, which he doesn't often fill, and comes back two weeks later, we'd have to think about something differently. So we began to think about this work some time ago um, and began to sort of partner with the community in understanding it. You can see where the, where the asthma admissions are in relation to kind of the hotspots. These are all building violations um, uh, where we found that landlords were really, um, you know, evicting if people raised issues about, about these building violations. And so you know, here's a notice, you know, saying we're going to evict you, no air conditioners allowed. So we began to work with the community to do that, attacking the social determinants of health, working directly with, uh, with majority of the social agencies to do that. Now, these collaborations, you'll see some look really strong, some look really weak. And as we're working in this space, we find that these collaborations are, there are huge gaps in these collaborations. 
So each individual agency works on a problem, but the children and family experience multiple problems. And so uh, this has been the, the kind of the impetus for us to really think about this very, very carefully with schools, with neighborhoods, with, uh, with uh, agencies in the neighborhood, with community health workers, um, you know, in our background in Avondale and, you know, elsewhere. And as we do this work, we found that we had to really think about asthma very differently if we wanted to reduce asthma admissions in the community with much more home-based care, much more work, and I think you're doing the same thing. And we have now similarly applied this work to prematurity and are starting to see some early signals of reduction in prematurity uh, using a place-based model, which basically says that I have to work in the neighborhood with the assets in the neighborhood, getting that neighborhood to work together versus maybe at a very macro level. This has taken us some time to figure out. So we'll really scale this in by neighborhood by neighborhood rather than uh, scale it um, differently because um, you know, in our prematurity work, we find that um, that trust is a very important part in these communities, and I'm sure many of you are aware of that, and their trust of most systems are very poor uh, because many systems have not necessarily worked, you know, in their favor. And so how do we deliver perfect clinical OB clinical care? How do we find the people early that are pregnant and have a warm and good handoff to the obstetrician or to the uh, to the nurse midwife, how does the community worker visit the family in their home and connect to the persons? And so this is kind of our model that we've been testing for reduction of prematurity with two big, uh, two big uh, hospitals, University and the Good Samaritan Hospital, where most of the delivery happens. And our goal is to find all of the mothers by 15 weeks in the community and to refer them to a case manager that is place-based so that if you're from zip code 45229, which is our zip code, that there is somebody that's looking for you, is there, and is a warm welcome, not sort of you're sitting in a chair somewhere and nobody knows who you are and nobody's cared for you. And with this work, we're finding some early opportunities. This is a days between chart uh, where we've gone up to, you know, over 300 days over a year without a prematurity in that neighborhood where before we would see them almost every, uh, every you know, maybe 12 to 18 uh, a year and they're finding some important uh, changes happening. And so we're very excited about this moving from healthcare to health. And I know that this will take us a lot of work and especially putting children first, which I think is the biggest challenge for us to think about. We just launched our network this, this, um, um, this month, I um, mean this week, um, in fact, and uh, we will be looking at 66,000 children in the city of Cincinnati with some pretty ambitious aims, taking what we've learned from improvement science now from the hospital you know, to the community. So it does take a lot of um, important and consistent messages and constancy of purpose to transform systems, but it also um, is not a, something that you do light of heart. Um, it does sort of rouse all kinds of emotions when you try to change people and how they think. But I think keeping the patient in the middle, keeping the child in the middle, and thinking about outcomes are a really good way to get started. So I'll stop there and take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Uma, that was fabulous. I have a question for you. Um, the work that you've done in Cincinnati is truly impressive. Talk to me about the infrastructure that you have in place to support this kind of work. Um, so I think um, I'll talk to you about the, the we have um, the Anderson Center, which was basically um, really created to support that work, um, analytic support, um, quality improvement support, similar to what you have, um, project management support. So those are the three kinds of groups of people that help us. I think more importantly, what we have are a very large number of operational leaders and faculty in the organization that, that see this as their work. So this track we built, uh, when Evie Alessandrini came from CHOP, we really built right away kind of a model for how faculty would be engaged in this work, what the promotion track looked like for faculty who were doing improvement. Uh, so on the operational track and for faculty doing research. So that was important. 
But I think at the nursing level, you know, at patient services level, all of the unit managers are trained in improvement. All of the uh, service line people are trained in improvement. I would not say that every division director is trained in improvement, uh, but every division has a quality person whose job it is to think about this alignment and understanding and, and where they go. And uh, we created something called the Advanced Improvement Leadership System, which is a mechanism to get academic divisions to be considering this part of their work. Um, so that, I think, is the infrastructure. Certainly, um, the analytics are very important. I think uh, because people are in production that are also doing improvement, you know, meaning they're, they're delivering care, but they're also doing improvement, um, some hassle reduction is pretty significant. You know, you've really got to pay attention to the fact that if they have an hour that day that someone's helping them. Um, and so that's where the quality improvement consultants and the project managers come in um, so that they can really extend that work. Um, um, so, yeah, I think it does take infrastructure and, um, and then tending that infrastructure very carefully so you don't, you know, you don't lose people that that are really, um, that know the system very well, that have spent time in the system and understand the system. Other questions? Thank you, that was really wonderful. Um, in addition to we ought to be doing this, are there, is there also return on investment that one can uh, actually look at that by doing this, that uh, one can get children out of the hospital uh, faster with fewer uh, complications, uh, that having this in place is good for retention of faculty. Have you looked at, at, at all the different other things? Yes, um, so I think in most cases we try to do the cost. I didn't show you all of the cost data, but we try to look at whether, it's, whether we see a benefit to it financially. But I would, I would say upfront that in my conversations with our senior leadership, you know, doing the right thing is always sort of the important question. Um, I would say that our, our research in this space is, is grown a lot um, in terms of effectiveness research, outcomes research. Um, certainly, I think our integration of that research with, uh, with improvement has made a big difference in, in many of our research studies. So we have basic scientists now engaged with us and thinking about this. So. In almost all of the disease-based, not almost all of the disease, and few of the disease-based stuff, that, that teamwork has been pretty important. Our flow work has saved us, you know, um, millions and millions of dollars, more in the 60 to $70 million range because our length of stay is shortened. But we're not shortening it by sending everybody out to the waiting room at 10 o'clock in the morning, shortening it in a different way. Our readmission rates are lower, um, so that makes a pretty big difference. Now, the challenge is that when we're moving from this from this uh, value-based, I mean, um, um, uh, more of a, you know, frequency-based model for payment to a value-based model for payment, that transition is going to be painful for all of us. Um, I'm not sure that the payment models will move simultaneously with the, with the uh, clinical care models. Um, so there's definitely opportunity there, but we know that uh, that, you know, from the point of view of longer term gain that we need to be able to manage populations differently. So we are moving in that direction, um, not necessarily as synchronized as one might want it to be. So yes, I think the gain's been great. Our, um, our retention rates are very, very high. Our, you know, employee satisfaction is, is high. Um, and, uh, but we're, you know, but, but these, these are very important transitional times, so it'll it'll remain to be seen how steady we stay we stay through these what I think are fairly difficult times ahead in terms of um, in terms of payment. We we are now obviously attracting a lot of patients nationally and internationally, like you are. So there are children's hospitals that do that, but for us that growth is is very very big. Um, not something that we had probably 15 years ago. Um, yes. Um, what exactly is the hospital doing to help chronic um, or asthmatic patients at the home level? So at the home level, a couple of things. One is making sure that the houses are mold-free. 
and, uh, you know, free of pests, so where necessary using legal aid or other mechanisms to move people out of housing, that's unsafe, so advocating for the patients. Um, you know, teaching asthma care at home instead of in the hospital so that they really are in their home setting. That allows the nurse also to see what the home setting looks like and, you know, provide, provide advice. And then, you know, much better self-management skills, even for little kids, so that they can really know how to, how to take their inhaler, how to manage their illness. We found, uh, very importantly, that many parents couldn't, didn't know the symptoms of asthma, if you will. So, you know, really moving that to a substantial level to understand. So those are some of the things that we did. Um, you showed a slide that had a very complex web of activity yes. related to your coordination yes. around the social yes. determinants. And um, I'm very interested in kind of how you're untangling yes. that well, so I think uh, I think the, the the analysis that we did was worked on was learned from MIT from Peter Glor's work. So you might look up his book, um, but it, we use it with our teams, and it's really uh, uses um, the data really shows how well we're connected. So in some cases, we might use emails as a mechanism to understand how tightly we're connected and see where our connections look really strong and where they look really weak. Uh, one of the goals for our FY17, which, which starts July 1, is going to be to find 25 families in our neighborhood for whom we could solve all the social determinants of health. Uh, and we are, um, you know, we think that we're going to have to figure it out one person at a time. I think uh, we're very inspired by the work of Becky Margiota and Jill McCannon, who worked on homelessness in America and how they really tackled it in terms of scale, and it's worth looking at their work. I think they're called the Billions Institute, um, going really, really deep to figure out how to solve the problem for one person and solving it for two, three, five, ten, then figuring out what the system is versus spending all your time kind of talking, 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 making lots of meetings and having lots of conversations and diagrams with actually nothing happening on the ground. So that's the model that we're kind of using to do that, to figure out you know, we could do that. And we believe that the agencies will participate if we say, okay, let's try to figure out how to get this done. And so at the point in this network that we've just launched last Monday, we have all of them at the table helping us think about it. So we're going to do it in a place-based way. So we're going to do it in one neighborhood because we think the community assets in the neighborhood themselves are important. Um, and, and take on some of these recalcitrant things to figure out how to solve them, not like there. But, but here and then figure out how to scale. Okay, hey, Uma, I'm going to keep you on time. Thank you so much. I know you have a Thank plane you. to catch. This has just been truly, truly fantastic. And congratulations on this just such important work and your lifetime of work and how you've transformed this country. So thank you so much. And we are not um, uh, finished. Dr. Kodigal uh, uh, will come back. She's promised us that. And so if there are additional questions, we'll have breakout sessions with her over this next year so that she can really help us understand what are some of the things that we need to do as we continue to transform Children's National. But congratulations and thank you so, thank you. so much for this great. <laughs>